You know, I'll tell you that uh, we have been uh, desensitized to the words of songs uh, because of the noise that surrounds a lot of songs. Uh, we judge a good song by the first beat coming out of the instrument rather than the first word uh, coming out of the lips. And boy, be the kind of Christian that you enjoy words uh, because words truly do matter at the end of the day. Philippians chapter 3, if you don't mind, if you'll go there. Philippians chapter 3. And uh, just a side note, if you will, a choir, I think what I'm going to do is just meet in the fellowship hall at quarter till the hour of six, and that way everyone can take advantage of the uh, prelude by the students, and uh, so if you'll, no choir practice at five, just be there at quarter till the hour, and I think you'll be fine. And then uh, Lucia and Leslie, it's been good to have you with us, and uh, so you have a wonderful trip back to Costa Rica, is that right? And been here for a little bit. In fact, the request for Come Thou Fount, uh, in English uh, was from them because they've only heard it in Spanish I think on this magnitude and so hope you enjoyed that that's my Christmas gift to you that'll cost you $19.99 I don't charge tax all right and no shipping and handling Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 9 through verse number 14 uh, keep your Bibles there and then also I want you to get ready to go back to the book of Acts because we're going there and, uh, and everybody listen because I know that the sermon this morning will help all of us my Myself included and going to try to add to what you've already heard in Sunday school uh, this morning so if you'll please listen I promise you it'll be a help to the people around you and to yourself Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 9 through verse number 14 and let's pray Heavenly Father thank you for all that you've done and Lord as we dive into this set of scriptures uh, I want to be a blessing Lord, so many people on my heart and my mind as I spent time in prayer this week and asking you to please bless our dear people, knowing for weeks now what the Sunday school lesson would be on, what the morning sermon would be on. And Lord, I knew that uh, to cover the same territory uh, at, the, at the 10 o'clock hour and then at the 11 o'clock hour uh, truly is, is sometimes not done, it's unheard of, but Lord, help me to compliment what was taught by the Sunday school teachers uh, in the Sunday school hour. Bless us now, please. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you'll look at verse number nine, it says this, and being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Up beside that verse, I want you to write salvation. That's talking about our standing in Christ Jesus that we are saved. Let me ask you a question. How many could say with a raised hand and an amen that you are saved? Would you raise your hand and say amen? Absolutely. That's you. You are not standing in your own righteousness by the law which brings death. But you are standing in God's righteousness through Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. I want you to underline that word perfect right there. And out beside this verse, I want you to write perfection. We are in between the time that we are saved and that day of salvation until the time we will be perfected. There's coming a time when your bodies, you'll have a glorified body and you no longer will have the imperfections that you now have. I think about Mrs. Uh, Hamilton right now that's struggling with the cancer and the cancer is starting to expose itself on the outside of her body and her and I talked about it Wednesday night and last Sunday, how that the pain is just incredible and how that now uh, Mrs. Hamilton was, Hamilton was telling me that now it's mashed potatoes and things that are soft in order to get it down and can I tell you something there's coming a day Mrs. Hamilton when you will not have that imperfect body but you will have a perfect body and I'll tell you one better than that your husband finally will be good looking and and so in between the time of salvation that's when you trusted Christ until the time that you are perfected in the image of Christ can I tell you something we have a lot of days to live we have a lot of seasons that we have to go through and if you'll look there in verse number 12 Paul was saying this not as though I'd already attained or were already perfect 
He said, I'm not there yet, but I follow after if that I may apprehend for that which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. What he's saying is this, the perfection that exists on the inside with eternity, with Jesus being sealed on the inside, I'm trying to get that on the outside in my everyday living. He said, but, but I'm not there yet. I'll never get there until I'm in heaven. So he tells us in verse number 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, look at it, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said, I'm stuck between salvation and between the time that I will be perfected in heaven and right now I have seasons of failure and I have seasons of times that I want to forget and Paul was on a constant quest every day to forget those things which were back here and reaching forth to those things which were in front of him. By the way, that's a great thing to do in your life because you won't keep your sanity if you're always dwelling on the failures that are behind you. You have to turn your back on those failures and you have to reach forth. Some people keep one hand on the failure and one hand reaching forth. That's not how God meant for us to live life. God meant for us to completely let go of the failure and completely turn and grab hold of what is before us. But listen to me, many people try to fix their failures by focusing on their failures, and that's not what he said. Look what he says here. Not the brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Then look what he says there in verse number 14. I press toward the what? Mark. I press toward the what? Mark of the prize of what kind of calling? High calling. Let me tell you something. If your failure yesterday is looked at as you're trying to go today, you can't compare the two. You have to turn, and guess what you're to shoot for? You're to shoot for the mark that Jesus sets of the high calling. A lot of people try to dissect their failure and then tweak their failure and try to do something better, improve on failure. Let me tell you something. You don't need to improve on failure. You need to forget failure and turn around and say, Jesus Christ, you're the mark. You're what I'm shooting for. I'm not shooting to better myself. I'm shooting for the prize, the mark, the high calling of Jesus Christ. And he's got that mark. Let me tell you something. We'll never attain unto perfection, but we better be jumping for it every day. My brother-in-law, Mark, uh, we graduated the same year from high school. And uh, in eighth grade year, I was looking at our football picture the other day. And in our eighth grade year, we were the same height. When it got to our freshman year, good night, he like shot up inches and kept growing. And I remember over in the gym when we would play basketball that he could jump up and he could grab the rim. I remember the first time that I saw Mark dunk a basketball, I was like, that's my goal. I have to get that rim. I have to be able to touch that rim. That was the mark. Mark set the mark. And that's all there was to it. And I remember the first day I grabbed that rim after jumping off a chair. I was the happiest man ever. He set the mark. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ set the mark in your life for you to attain to. Don't imitate your failure. Don't paint your failure. Don't tweak your failure. Don't try to take out the bad. Forget it. Forget it. Take your hands off of it. Forget it. It didn't work back there. Now you turn and you grab hold of things before you and you grab hold on them with pressing. Take them and press life. Press life to that high calling of Jesus Christ. When I was looking at this, and I put myself in Paul's shoes when he said this, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. And here's where the sermon's coming down to three things. He said, I'm going to forget those things which are behind. So I thought, my soul. Paul is saying, I'm forgetting some things back here. What did Paul want to forget? What kind of failures were out there that Paul said, I want to forget those kind of failures? The first kind of failure was personal failure. The first kind of failure you need to take your hands off that you may have experienced back here in 2014 is personal 
failure. I want you to take your Bibles, go to the, the Acts chapter 7. And as I went back and I studied the book of Acts and I started studying uh, the Acts of the Apostles and I started studying the Acts of Paul in particular, I noticed that maybe one of those things that Paul was saying, I want to forget, I want to move on from, is that personal failure. And look, if you will, in Acts chapter 7 and verse number, uh, verse number 38, if you will, Acts chapter 7 and... Uh, Verse, verse number 58, I'm sorry, verse number 58, Acts chapter 7, verse 58. And cast him out of the city, talking about Stephen, and cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down the clothes at a young man's feet whose name was what? I want you, I want you to look at it again. Don't trust me right now. Uh, too many people trust the pastor. I really want you to look at the word. All right, you got it? Look at the word. I'm not saying something you can't see, but I want you to see it. You need to see it. Look at it. And cast the clothes that laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was what Saul now go to chapter 8 and verse number 1 and look at this and Saul was what's the next word consenting unto his death in Acts chapter 8 verse 1 guess what it says in Acts chapter 7 they were stoning Stephen and they were stoning and he there he laid and in Acts chapter 8, it said, and Saul was consenting. You know what the word consenting means? The word consenting means applaud. Paul was standing there as a young man going. <laughs> Hit him again. Hit him again. Every time the stone hit and blood would come out, he was like, hit him again. He took so much eye pleasure in what he was seeing, that it became insatiable to him. He was consenting. He was applauding. He was saying, that's good. Oh, that's good. It's like somebody in the stands when you see your favorite team score, if you will, and they, and they keep running the score up. And by the way, I'm for running the score up. Amen. <laughs> and, and they run that score up. Let me tell you, wake up and get this. You can go back to sleep. Listen to me. Saul was standing there going, I like what I see. I am taking pleasure in somebody else dying. I am taking pleasure in somebody else dying blood and somebody else's pain and Saul was saying I really like this he not only was present when Stephen was being stoned but he was loving the fact Stephen was stoned no wonder Paul said I want to forget that day when I really enjoyed the ill of somebody else and I want to forget those moments to where I took pleasure in sin and in hurting other people listen to me you probably cannot believe that you actually enjoyed failing someplace in your past listen to me forget it turn loose of it let it die let it be overcome with weeds of life don't go back there don't even look at it personal failure is what you have to overcome. And then if you'll look at it with me, if you don't mind, in, in Acts chapter 9 in verse number 1, this insatiable desire that Paul had to kill the Christians and kill those who named the name of Christ. Look at Acts chapter 9 verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of Christ, went unto the high priest, Acts 9.2, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Not only did he take pleasure, listen to this, in the death and in the blood and in the gore, but he said, now I want to lead and I'll take pleasure in going into people's houses and dragging them out. I'll take pleasure in going in if somebody says I named the name of Christ. I'm the guy that I want to see them bound and I want to drag them to Jerusalem so that they'll be slaughtered and that they'll die. No wonder Paul was saying, I want to forget those things which are behind me because I have days when I was not what I needed to be and I have actions that I did that I can't believe I did and I have things of how I felt and how I behaved way back there that I should never have behaved that way and I should never have acted that way. Listen to me, it is possible for you to outlive the darkest night in your life. It is possible for you to outlive the darkest day in your life and I'm preaching to people right now that you are haunted by the failures of what you were 
in days gone by. But praise the Lord Jesus Christ that when he died on the old rugged cross, his blood cleansed us from all sin. And those dark nights and those dark days don't have to be a part of who you are. Forget those things which are behind. Forget those dark nights and turn around and grab where you want to be. Don't live where you were. Live where you want to be to the high calling of Jesus Christ. If you were that bad, my friend, he would have killed you after you did it. But there's a reason why you're still ticking and you're still alive. Want to know why? He's got higher things for you to do. Don't you get so wrapped up in people saying amen right now that you think they're weird. It'd do you good if you say amen and get involved in the service. And let me tell you something. Sometimes we get bogged down with guilt. About Paul, No doubt Paul was saying, I cannot believe that I enjoyed a man of God being stoned and I cannot believe that I enjoyed dragging men and women to their death. Boy, I don't want to remember that. And so he had to overcome it. And he had, listen to this, to forget it. You'll be no good to anybody around you if you're always remembering it. Those personal failures. Those things found on your spiritual resume that you have to be honest about. Those things that when your wife asks you, you know the truth. Those failures in your life that everybody else thinks you're okay, but you know your personal failures. Please listen to me. If you're going to have a great new year, you better get geared up over the next couple of days that you forget those personal failures. They're failures. Listen to me. The you right now is not the you that committed those failures. Because if it was still you, you wouldn't be in church this morning. If it was still you, you wouldn't have a Bible in your hand. If it was still you, you wouldn't be singing the praises of God. Boy, isn't this crazy how Romans chapter 7 is very much real in our lives. The things that I would do, I do not. Should do, I do not. And the things I shouldn't do, that's what I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Let me tell you something. In Christ Jesus, you better take a page out of Paul's Christianity that says this. I'm going to forget those things, those personal failures back there. I'm going to forget them. I'm going to put them where they need to be, and that's under the blood of Jesus Christ. The second kind of failure that you need to forget is the, what I call the role failure. Your role in life is very, very important. I want you to go to, to uh, Philippians chapter, uh, chapter 3, if you don't mind. Philippians chapter 3. Paul was just not an ordinary man. Paul was a man that he had a pedigree. His status among the Jews was very, very high. He was not your lowest of, the, of, 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 of a Gentile dog, if you will. Paul's status among the Jews is very, very important to this one point right here. And, and if you're not going to turn there, you're going to miss it. Philippians chapter 3, and look at verse number 4. That I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more... Listen to the pedigree of Paul. Listen to it. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee. You know what Paul said? Let me roll out who I am. I am, I was circumcised the eighth day. I am of the stock of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew's a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and when it comes to the law, I'm a Pharisee, simply meaning I'm a very smart man when it comes to the law. But let me show you what I did with my position when I rose to that position. It's found in verse number six. Look at it. Concerning zeal, what's the next phrase? Persecuting the what? Church. You know what he said? Listen very closely. The second failure you need to get past is this. Not only the personal failures, but the role failure, that position that you hold, that who you are. Paul said, listen to me, I used who I was to hurt, to persecute, when I should have used who I was to promote the Lord Jesus Christ. I sat down and I listed 
10 roles that I have. I'm a Christian, I'm a husband, I'm a parent, I'm a grandparent, I'm a son, I'm a sibling, I'm a pastor, I'm a boss, I'm an employee, I'm a friend. Those 10 roles that I have, there is no doubt in my mind that I have failed in every one of these roles in 2014. I have no doubt as a Christian, I have failed. I have no doubt as a husband, I have failed. I have no doubt as a parent, I have failed. I have no doubt as a grandparent, I have failed. I have no doubt as a son, I have failed. As a sibling, I have failed. Don't answer that, siblings. As a pastor, I have failed. As a boss, I have failed. As an employee, I have failed. And as a friend, I have failed. But if I'm going to have a good 2015, then I have to forget the failures that I have had in any one of these areas that I am. I'm going to challenge you before 2014. List your role in this life. List who you are in this life. And then ask yourself the question, have you been the kind of spouse you needed to be? Have you been the kind of parent you needed to be? Hey, student, have you been the kind of student you needed to be? Hey, college student, have you been the kind of college student that you needed to be? Whatever role you are, you know what Paul said? I not only have personal failures because I cheered on the death of a man and I cheered I cheered on the gore of a society and I cheered on and I wanted to hurt. I, I failed personally, but I also failed as my role because I was the top of the Hebrew ladder. I was the top Jewish dog in the society and all I did was persecute. Are you using your role to hurt people or are you using your role to serve people? Boy, I preached about it last Sunday morning, and I think I'll say it again. There's only two ways to serve a kid, to run a kingdom. You're either running that kingdom like Herod and killing people, or you're running that kingdom like Jesus Christ and serving people. I say tonight, that this morning, that any failure as your position, you can correct in 2015. Just take your hand, just forget it. Listen to me. There are no amount of words you could use to describe how you feel about failing as a parent to your children. There's no amount of words, there's no words you can use that would even make up for failing as a spouse. You can sit them down and you can say, look, let me describe the kind of frame of mind I was at the time I did that. Let me try to try to describe to you what was going on in my life when I failed as a leader and, 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 and my role. Forget it. Take your hands off the excuses and turn around and today forget those things that you are behind and behave today in that role like you should have behaved back yonder. I think too many times we try to reason our way out of our failure rather than just stop excusing, stop talking, get up, dust yourself off, get the high calling of Jesus Christ and start behaving like you should have behaved back there. You say, well, I'm going to look like a hypocrite. Better you look like a hypocrite going that way than look like a hypocrite going that way. Better you look like a hypocrite trying to do better than look like a hypocrite never try. You want a great 2015? Press toward that mark. Get up and march toward that mark. Stop making excuses. All right, so you failed. Get up and let's press toward the high calling of Jesus Christ. When Paul looked at his life, he said, I'm trying to forget my personal failures. I can't believe that I was that young man that loved blood and guts and seeing somebody die. I I cannot believe that I would drag somebody out and take them to prison. I can't believe that. I can't even believe that I used my position as a Hebrew That I, listen to this, he had so much influence with the Sanhedrin that he could walk right in and say, give me the letters, I'll serve them, and I'll bring them to justice. That's how much power he had. But he used his zeal to persecute the church. Last failure, are you ready? Here it is, tops the list. I want you to go, if you will, to Acts chapter 6. The last failure that Paul was forgetting And the highest calling, the highest calling that anybody could ever have, Acts chapter 6 and verse 8. Look at it. Acts chapter 6, start with verse number 6. Whom they set before the apostles, Acts 6, 6. Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, 
And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient in faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And there arose certain of the synagogue, which called the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and of them a Cilician of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborn men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and called him and brought him to the council. Now look at Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. Go two chapters over. Here Stephen is on a roll and did great wonders, great miracles. People are believing, great revivals taking place. Oh, please look at the scripture. Don't stare at me. Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, inhaling men and women, committed them to prison. What was his third failure that topped the list? Not only a personal failure, not only a role failure, listen to this, and I'm done, a gospel failure. He failed. He wanted to stop the gospel of Jesus Christ from being spread. Listen to me. If there's one failure that will top the list, it's this failure. Your personal failures bring you temporal, earthly pain. Your role failures bring a temporal, earthly pain to those around you. But your gospel failures will bring an eternal damnation to those you do not give the gospel to. I'm not trying to get you to show up on Saturday right now. I'm not trying to get you to, to do whatever. I'm telling you right now, if you're saved, don't be a failure with the gospel. Don't neglect your obligation to take the good news of Jesus Christ and take it to a lost and dying world from the top of the balcony to the lower floor, from one side of the room to the other side of the room. If you name the name of Christ, then I beg you right now, don't you do one thing that stops the gospel from getting out, but step forward and start telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul said, I want to forget those things which are behind. There was a time when I tried to stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now you know why these words are so important in Paul's life. Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto me, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Romans 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, listen to what was on his business card, called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. Romans 1.19, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. Romans 1.15, so as much as is within me, I am ready to preach the gospel to them that are Rome. Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Romans 16.1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that Israel, that they might be saved. 1 Corinthians 9.16, for though I preach the gospel I have nothing to glory um, for necessity is laid upon me yea woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel you know what Paul was saying I failed with Stephen I failed in my role as a Hebrew and I failed with the gospel but it's not going to be that way anymore in my life from the Tao to the day I die I'm going to make sure that people know about the greatest news ever and that's Jesus Christ died Jesus Christ was buried and Jesus Christ rose again Fail in your personal life, but don't fail with the gospel. Fail with your family, but don't fail with the gospel. Fail in your leadership, but don't fail with the gospel. Never let it be said that you lived and you died and you never told anybody about Jesus Christ. I put tracks in the pews sitting right there in front of you. I wish the pews would be empty this morning. I wish you'd take those tracks. And I wish you'd be able to say, I'm not going to fail with the gospel. 
How do you fix these failures? I'm done with this. How do you fix them? How do you fix personal failures? How do you fix role failures? How do you fix gospel failures? The same way Paul fixed those failures. We're done with this. Acts chapter 9 and verse number 5. Acts chapter 9 and verse number 5. How do you fix them, pastor? I failed personally. How do I fix it? I failed as a husband, as a wife, as a mother, as a husband, as a son, as a sibling, as a grandparent, as a boss. How do I fix these failures? You fix them the same way Paul fixed them. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? You know how he fixed him? Jesus. You see, you don't fix your failures by holding on to your failures. You fix your failures by holding on to Jesus. He held on to Jesus in three ways in Acts chapter 9. One, salvation. Some of you are trying to fix your world without Jesus. You may use the principles of God's word to get you two miles down the road. But you have to get Jesus to go all the way down the road. Some of you just need to be saved. You've been trying to act like a family member and you're not part of the family. Only because you don't have the Savior. The second way he fixed his failures was through baptism. He got baptized. 1 Peter 3, 21. Baptism gives you the answer of a good conscience. You're trying to go forward in fixing your problem, but you're trying to fix problem 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 25 without taking care of the first identification you need, and that's baptism. I stand unashamedly to tell you that water cannot wash away your sins. That water has no saving power to take away your sins. But that water does have identification power to where when you get baptized, what you're telling the entire world is, I no longer belong to the devil's family. I now belong to the family of God. And I am unashamed like Christ died on the old rugged cross. Every believer that gets saved needs to mount that baptistry right there or one like it and simply say, I am unashamed of Jesus Christ. I represent the death of Christ. I represent the burial of Christ and the resurrection of Christ and it gives you that clear conscience that you need to fix your problems I just feel like something's wrong have you been saved boy I just I just feel like something have you been baptized third thing that you find out is Paul was submissive there's a man in Acts called Ananias and he allowed Ananias to lead him I'm done Titus come here if you don't mind come here let let Titus be Ananias listen I only get to preach once today so I'm going to go over about five minutes over that be okay that's okay I asked Scott what he was preaching we'll be here for three hours no he's not two minutes two minutes listen to this he started fixing his problems through salvation he continued to fix through baptism and then through submission there was a man named Ananias and Paul was blind and he led him you better not lead me off the side of that platform and he led him go that way and he led him let me tell you something you want to fix your problems watch this let somebody lead you let me lead you Let let the pastor and the word lead you. The reason people get themselves into problems, all of us included, is because we're not smart enough to stay out of problems, all of us included. That's why you need somebody who's older and wiser than you. You say, well, I got you beat by 50 years. Yeah, but you don't have him beat by 50 years. Forget how old I am. I preach an eternal book that's older than all of us put together. Let God lead you. And you're going to find out that's how you fix it. How do I forget those things? The same way Paul did. 
Saul, Saul. This is the real closing and we're done. Saul's name was changed to Paul. His failures were always associated with Saul. But when God got a hold of him, his name was changed to Paul. You say, Pastor, people have been around me when I have failed those personal failures. Pastor, my children, my grandchildren, my employees, my, my boss, they've been around when I have failed in my role. And Pastor, there's people that I've never witnessed to that I have failed with the gospel. That's okay. Let God get a hold of you and you won't be known as Saul. You'll be known as Paul. You can outlive failures, but you only do it by forgetting those things. Press toward the mark of the high call of Jesus Christ. Get where he's at. Heavenly Father.